The Social Democratic Party of Germany, or the SPD, was founded in 1875 by the merger of the General German Workers Association, founded by Ferdinand Lassell, and the Social Democratic Workers Party of Germany, founded by August Bebel and Wilhelm Leichnet. First called the Socialist Workers Party, or SAP, the founding document or party platform was called the Gotha Program. It received harsh criticism from Marx and Engels for its perceived Lazalian flavor. The Gotha Program stated, quote, Labor is the source of all wealth and all culture. The emancipation of labor must be the work of the laboring class, opposed to which all other classes are only a reactionary body. It sought, quote, the free state and the socialist society, the destruction of the iron law of wages, the overthrow of exploitation in all forms, and the abolition of all social and political inequality. Marx critiqued and objected to the iron law of wages thesis, the idea that nothing can prevent wages from falling below a subsistent level. He also argued against the free state ambiguity and the idea that other oppressed classes are only reactionary. Bhaskar Sankara writes on Marx's critique, quote, Only a decade had passed since Lassalle's failed overture to Bismarck. And he thought it vital for the SAP, later SPD, to have a clear view of the state. As he wrote in the German ideology in 1846, 20 years prior to the Gotha program, the executive of the modern state is nothing but a committee for managing the common affair of the whole bourgeoisie. A party whose social ideas were more than skin deep we have to overcome that state and fight for a transition period, quote, in which the state can be nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote. Marx also heavily criticized Lazalian philosophy of viewing the state as autonomous from class rule. Over the next 15 years, from 1875 to 1890, it saw the German Empire's first chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, continually passed legislation against social democratic movements called social zygots. The SAP, or SPD, could stand for elections, but the act of campaigning was effectively outlawed. Meetings were explicitly illegal, newspapers shut down, members arrested, factory owners made workers sign vows that they were not social democrats. Bismarck at the same time started to offer workers a, quote, socialism from above, health insurance, and social security scams. This started to radicalize the SAP. From 1880 to 1883, they removed a clause in the Gotha program vowing to only struggle by legal means, called their party a, quote, revolutionary one, and proud of its roots in, quote, the great master Marx. The second international, the successor to the International Workingmen's Association, was founded in Paris on Bastille Day 1889, 100 years after the French Revolution. 400 delegates from 19 countries attended. The German delegates were told by Bebel to burn papers before returning home and to look out for state agents in their ranks. The next year, in 1890, Bismarck resigned, and the anti-socialist laws expired. Over the last 15 years of political persecution, the renamed SPD gained a sizable political base. One out of five Germans supported the party. Due to the federalized nature of the German Empire and suffrage being unequal, SPD only received 35 seats in the Reichstag off of 1.4 million votes while the German Conservative Party received 73 seats out of less than a million votes. The state was also functionally still an autocratic monarchy. The emperor dictated foreign policy and appointed the chancellor. Due to this, the SPD viewed the state as a sham and became more radical. In 1891, the party adopted a new platform written by Karl Katowski and Edward Bernstein called the EFERT program. The program called for socialization of all private production, such a, quote, transformation amounts to the emancipation not only of the proletariat, but the entire human race. Later, it states, quote, without political rights, the working class cannot carry on its economic struggles and develop its economic organization. It cannot bring about the transfer of the means of production into the possession of the community without first having obtained political power. It declared the party fights not only the exploitation and oppression of wage earners in society today, but every manner of exploitation and oppression, whether it's directed against a class, party, sex, or race. The program called for universal suffrage, free Medicare, replacement of the German army with the public militia, end to child labor, eight-hour workday, prohibition of night work, etc., there was a divide in the program's apocalyptic detailing of capitalism and its immediate calls for reform. 
Quote, it is the task of the Social Democratic Party to shape the struggle of the working class into a conscious and unified one. The party's concept was one that prepares for revolution, but not necessarily create a violent revolution. Katowski and Bernstein were in effect the new superstars of the international socialist movement, both men having close ties to Marx and Engels and shaping German socialist policy, which was the epicenter of the international socialist movement. Katowski was seen as, quote, Pope to Marxism. And when Marx and Engels died in 1883 and 1895, respectively, Katowski was seen as the heir to Engels and the traditional Marxist school of philosophy. During the 1890s, Bernstein started to drift towards the center left and away from traditional Marxist theory. Bernstein saw radical Marxist theory as unrealistic in his work with the workers' movements in England. He didn't see this rising struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. He saw capitalism adjusting. Quote, intermediary classes formed. Capitalism at that time was thriving from a monetary perspective, and struggles of the working class improving through slight reforms and legislations. He thought capitalism had proven it could self-regulate and avoid the types of crises that traditional Marxist theory stated would happen. The English translation of his work on this issue is ironically titled Evolutionary Socialism. Katowski, being on the more traditional side of the SPD, eventually had to respond to his friend. After a series of disagreements, both privately and publicly, he said to Bernstein that he wasn't a social democrat anymore. He didn't have a place in the SPD. Bavarian reformist George von Vollmer went further than Bernstein, calling for the SPD to turn into a broader, quote, people's party, which Katowski responded that would mean going from a party of the fighting proletariat into an eclectic swamp of frustrated fellows. Rosa Luxemburg, who already was a famed socialist in Poland, was now a teacher within the SPD party. She wrote the best synthesis of Marxist orthodoxy yet called social reform or revolution. She argued against Bernstein's idolizing of capital reform saying it was far from stabilized, and finance capital and industry cartels increased the system's crises. She wasn't outright against trade unions, but she saw them as, quote, suppression of the abuses of capitalism instead of suppression of capitalism itself, end quote. There was a difference between Katowski and Luxembourg on the view of active revolution versus the passive role of the party that Katowski and Bernstein implemented, but now Katowski and Luxembourg were aligned against Bernstein and the, quote, revisionist of the party, as Bernstein and others were called. Important to note, during this time, though, the party went from 352,000 members at its founding in 1875 to 3 million members in 1903. The party was now attracting middle-class voters and followers. The revisionists wanted to use this time to make tactical alliances with liberals to win reforms. Katowski and Bebel were able to keep the party platform consistent with the effort program, though. The failed Russian Revolution of 1905 gave the SPD more urgency. The powerful Romanov monarchy was almost overthrown, and there was a push for more militant response to capitalism and the monarchy within Germany. Mass or general strikes became the discussion between radicals and revisionists. Rosa Luxemburg traveled to Poland to radicalize workers there, and would write the mass strike, the political party, and trade unions during that time, when for magnum opus. She endorsed mass strikes, but differed from anarchists, because she didn't equate mass strikes with revolution. She saw it as a tool to raise class consciousness and exert power. Political and economic struggles were not separate in her mind, so instead of trade unions launching limited strikes, an indefinite general strike could win political gains and thus greater economic ones. She viewed the movement with a direct goal, the dictatorship of the proletariat, a task quote, accomplished during a long period of gigantic social struggles. Unlike other traditionalists like Bebel, she didn't see mass strikes as a one-off event directed by the party. It was a grassroots phenomenon that can't be turned off or on by command. As the party was growing, its affiliated trade unions were growing at a much larger pace, and organized labor favored Bernstein's approach over Luxembourg's, and it was rather simple why the trade unions were gaining more steam than the radical wing of the party. The trade union, by disrupting production, was able to win tangible gains. But the logic of capitalism set limits on the demands of the trade unions because the unions were by design seeking compromise. It was a climate of moderation, of reform, not revolution. Trade unions were also dominated by a conservative leadership with a growing bureaucratic layer within the unions and party. Heading into the SPD's Genia Congress of 1905, the trade unions wanted to forbid discussion on mass strikes, telling radicals to, quote, go back to Russia. The party endorsed mass strikes as a legitimate tactic at the Congress, but gave in to trade union demands on a major caveat. Trade unions were granted major veto power within the party, specifically on if the party can call for strikes. 
the radical or traditional Marxist wing of the party and its leadership, to be more accurate, gave in to center-left demands for the sake of party unity. That would be a reincurring theme throughout SPD history. Friedrich Ebert would come into the party around this time in the early 1900s and actually be taught by Rosa Luxemburg. He wasn't a hardline socialist, but he was incredible at organizing the party's record-keeping and infrastructure. He would be the one to push the party to restructure for the first time since the party's creation in 1875, and thus adding the bureaucratic layer that existed in the trade unions. The party's mainstream traditionalists like Bebel would slowly engage in tactical alliances with revisionists as Ebert was pushing the party towards the center. The radicals, largely led by Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Leichnett, son of the SPD founder, Wilhelm Leichnett, understood the administrative machine Ebert created would improve SPD efficiency, member engagement, etc. But they saw the conservative wing of the party rise to power and thought a capitalistic crisis would allow the radicals to overtake the mainstream of the party again. So term limits, greater oversight, or any reform to the bureaucratic layer were not pushed by the radicals. The party was the only anti-military or anti-imperialist party in Germany, and that was largely because of the younger Leichnett. He sought war, militarism, and nationalism, ultimately as the central issues of the time, and called for the abolition of the military. On the issue of mass strikes being used to prevent war, the Second International Congress in 1907 saw the SPD be pushed to pass a resolution supporting the idea by Leichnett, British and French socialists. Gustav Nosk would call the Social Democrats vagabonds without a fatherland, showing the SPD delegation was not pleased with the radicals within the Second International. The SPD, though, was clearly in the middle of a crisis as the 1907 election saw them lose half their Reichstag seats. The election was a referendum on the German Empire, and the SPD, as the only anti-war party, lost and were extremely vulnerable. Katowski saw this as the class struggle pushing out unstable middle-class allies. So most of the traditionalists thought to stay the course as the party of opposition. Revisionists saw this electoral loss as the fall of the radicals like Luxembourg and Leichnett. Bebel would join Ebert in assuring bourgeoisie critics while claiming the party wasn't anti-national. Bernstein himself would end up in support of imperialism and colonialism as he saw it as, quote, civilizing missions, while Luxembourg and Leichnett, obviously the majority of the party, were still staunchly anti-colonial. As the world was heading towards the horrifying history of World War I, the SPD in 1910 was tearing itself apart. Katowski's effort program was getting attacked by conservatives now, like SPD founder Bebel and his friend Bernstein and newcomer Nosk, who wanted more accommodations to the trade unions and middle-class progressives, while radicals such as Luxembourg and Leichnett called for a more revolutionary platform for the party. Katowski by 1912, though, would align himself more and more with the center of the SPD party, leaving the party to fracture during the war. By the time we get to 1914 and the start of World War I, the party's response was too slow in generating mass demonstrations against the war. Ebert, with Bebel passing away just before the war, had consolidated party power and used Russian war mobilization as an excuse to push the party to support the war. 78 out of 92 SPD parliamentarians voted for funding the war. Leon Trotsky would describe this moment as, quote, one of the most tragic days of his life. The party was split during the war. Those opposed to the war, like Luxembourg and even centrists like Bernstein and Katowski, split from the SPD to form the Independent Social Democratic Party, or the USPD. German socialists, still largely led by Katowski, opposed Lenin's Bolshevist philosophy of using the war to generate a workers' revolution. Katowski and many socialists were facing persecution and arrest within Germany and were mainly looking for peaceful resolutions to end the war. Luxembourg and Leichnett formed the Spartacus League within the USPD before breaking away and forming the Communist Party of Germany, or the KPD. After the war, the German Revolution was beginning, mirroring the start of the Russian Revolution the year prior. The German military and workers started a mass mutiny and strike against the German Federation. However, instead of a Lenin or Trotsky type taking hold and steering the party towards a revolution, Ebert and Oss came in with their status within the SPD to take over these mass strikes and shut them down while simultaneously taking control of the country and instituting a bourgeoisie democracy. Luxembourg and Leichnett led another revolution in 1919 against the SPD, the party that Leichnett's father founded, and against the very men that Rosa Luxembourg taught decades prior. Nosk and Ebert would unleash paramilitary death squads in Berlin and elsewhere, stamping out the communist revolution and murdering 
Rosa Luxemburg, and Karl Leichnant. It would relieve the disastrous Weimar Republic until his death in 1925. Gustav Nosk believed even the bourgeoisie republic was too radical and gave power over to conservative war hero Paul von Hindenburg, who in turn would give power to the Nazi party and Adolf Hitler in the 1930s. 